Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I will start with some announcements. Um, first of all, on July 9th we have this new thing we love called Video Stream where people can watch what goes on here at our center all over the world and we can't feed you, that's the only bad part about it, but you can watch the classes ask questions. We have somebody set up at every one of these things to take emails and, and um, direct questions to the speaker. So, a couple of things that you can video stream. On July 9th from 9 to 1, we're doing a special four-hour workshop um, on weight loss. This is for people who are interested in losing weight and have tried a lot of things that didn't work. Um, we have some things here that do work. We've done a lot of research on this. We know weight loss programs don't work. We know that you don't want to do some of the crazy things that people are suggesting that you do out there. Wait till you hear next week's video clips, for example. Um, so anyway, from 9 to 1, that's Eastern Time on July 9th, and what you need to do is email pampopper at msn.com, and I'll get your email to the person in our office who will be handling the video stream for that day so you'll know who you need to um, uh, communicate with and also um, know all the instructions on how to do it. On July 13th is our next monthly dinner. Again, we can't feed you dinner, but what we can do is allow you to participate in a lively discussion about diet, health, and medicine led by me and ask questions. And on that same night at 9 o'clock is a free teleconference workshop on the gut microbiome and probiotics. And if you want to do any of those things, email Pam Popper at msn.com. I think we are down to 28 annual passes or something like that. So um, we said 50 was the limit and we've almost sold half of them uh, and we have a whole month of July to go. So you might want to contact us if you're interested in saving a couple thousand dollars on wellness forum health programs, okay? All right, so let's get into our topics here. And I want to start out with uh, atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease, still the leading cause of death in this country. Uh, the interaction of gut bacteria with two nutrients, choline and carnitine, results in increased production of something called TMAO. It's a metabolite that has been linked to increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So let's start with a little bit of conversation about the nutrients. Carnitine plays a role in health by contributing to energy production and helping to remove the toxic byproducts of energy production. The body makes enough carnitine to handle function. You don't have to consume it in food. But most people do because the concentrated sources of carnitine are red meat and dairy. And the redder the meat is, the higher the carnitine level. Just four ounces of steak, for example, contains between 56 and 162 milligrams of carnitine. Now, choline contributes to nerve and muscle function and neurotransmitter synthesis. Dietary sources of choline include meat, dairy, fish, poultry, and eggs. Red meat and eggs, particularly high concentration of choline. A recent study looked at the relationship between plasma TMAO levels and the degree of atherosclerosis in 353 patients with coronary artery disease and determined that, quote, fasting plasma TMAO levels are, are an independent predictor of a high atherosclerotic burden in patients with coronary artery disease. So here's what we're saying. You eat the animal foods, you take in a lot of carnitine and choline, those nutrients interact with your gut bacteria, they produce a byproduct called TMAO. The higher your TMAO levels, the more likely, are, likely, or likely you are to have atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. Um, people who eat an omnivorous diet, not surprisingly, have higher TMAO levels than vegetarians or vegans, and levels remain lower in vegetarians and vegans even after consuming, uh, for example, carnitine, either in animal foods or in supplement form. And the reason is that those of us who are plant eaters have different gut bacteria than the carnivores do, and so we don't have the right bacteria to convert carnitine into TMAO and to create atherosclerosis and coronary artery artery disease for ourselves. So even if you could talk me into eating a steak, not likely to happen, I still would not suffer the same consequences as the person who eats that stuff all the time. Plasma L-carnitine levels um, are predictive of both the presence of coronary artery disease and the risk of cardiovascular events, um, but only for those who have higher TMAO levels, okay? So again, doesn't pertain to people like me who eat plants, it pertains to the animal foods eaters. And experiments with mice, L-carnitine supplementation changed the composition of the gut microbiome, increasing both production of TMAO and the development of atherosclerosis. So, if you could talk me into eating steak, 
On an ongoing basis, I would have the same problems as many other people in this country with coronary artery disease. Alterations in the gut microbiome and increased production of TMO as a result of eating a diet high in animal products are just a couple of the ways in which current prevalent dietary patterns contribute to coronary artery disease, and it's one of the reasons it's still the leading cause of death in the United States and in most westernized countries. The benefits of a plant-based diet include favorable changes to the gut microbiome, and by the way, uh, not only does this reduce plasma levels of TMAO, but um, it, it makes all kinds of other things better too. Vegans and vegetarians have different gut bacteria. We'll be talking about that on my free workshop on gut bacteria in uh, another week or two. Um, but plant-based uh, plant foods are beneficial in other ways too, one of which is that they're high in antioxidants that protect the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels from oxidation. In fact, plant-based diets have been shown to be effective for treating markers of coronary artery disease like hypertension and high cholesterol and heart disease itself. Research conducted by Dr. Dean Ornish showed that 82% of patients with coronary artery disease who remain compliant on a plant-based diet had at least some regression of their atherosclerosis, 91% reduced experienced a reduction in the incidence of chest pain, and 53% of the controls who were instructed to eat a diet commonly recommended by the American Heart Association showed disease progression. Ornish's patients also showed an average 37.2% reduction in plasma LDL cholesterol. I like to uh, bring Dean's research into the mix sometimes. We spend a lot of time focusing on Dr. Esselstyn. His research is awesome, but we forget sometimes, and it is important. He's not the only person that has shown that it is possible to eat your way out of coronary artery disease instead of taking drugs and having procedures. An analysis of five studies, including over 76,000 patients all told, showed that vegetarians had a 24% lower death rate from ischemic heart disease than non-vegetarians. So here's the bottom line, you guys. Conventional treatment for coronary artery disease has at best limited efficacy. I have talked about this on and on for years and years on this YouTube channel and in many of the articles that I write, etc. Focusing on dietary change makes a whole lot of sense because, first of all, it does reduce the death rate from coronary artery disease because it reverses or stops the progression of the condition. And um, it's, it's, the, it's the best we can do. And think about the other thing, too. There are no side effects. Think about all the risks and, and side effects associated with taking drugs and having procedures. You don't get any of that with a plant-based diet. I always tell people side effects of hanging out with me and eating with me are weight loss, improved skin, more energy, sleep better at night, don't have to take drugs, don't spend a lot of time hanging out in doctor's offices, finding out what's wrong, being scared half to death. I could go on, but you get the idea. All right, let's transition to another topic that affects a lot of people, um, and that is ductal carcinoma in situ. It's the most frequent form of cancer diagnosed with mammography. And um, it's a very early stage cancer, so much so that there is a growing number of professionals who are saying we should not even be calling this cancer. Um, many women, if not most, would be better off not knowing about it because it does not usually progress to invasive cancer. And I'm going to give you some very specific statistics on this in a minute. The problem is that women who are diagnosed with DCIS are told they have cancer, and what follows is surgery, sometimes even mastectomy, uh, radiation, um, sometimes chemotherapy, and often drugs, uh, which are taken for a long period of time. Now, the justification for all of this is the assurance that if you don't do this, you will progress to having invasive cancer, but research simply does not support this stance. Studies of thousands of women who had breast biopsies in the 1950s and 1960s and were untreated show that the risk of developing invasive breast cancer or dying, for, uh, or dying from it are very low. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples. A group of women in Tennessee... 25% um, of women who had DCIS but did not have any treatment because this was back in the days before we treated everybody, 25% uh, developed uh, invasive cancer within a 10-year period of time. For a group of women in Italy, only 11% of the women developed invasive cancer, and it took 20 years for those to develop. Now, what this means is that an average of 82% of women did not develop invasive breast cancer who had DCIS. 
And for those who did, the invasive cancer grew over a long period of time which makes watchful waiting, I like to term it active surveillance. Watchful waiting seems like we're just not going to do anything, but active surveillance, shape up your life, practice optimal habits, and then if we did this, we would only treat the women who actually developed cancer, and the vast majority of women would be left alone. And if we stopped calling it cancer, the women who did not have treatment wouldn't feel so nervous about it. As for reducing the risk of death from breast cancer, a study comparing the life expectancy of women with breast cancer to similar aged women without it showed that women with metastatic breast cancer, not surprisingly, had a 12 times higher risk of dying of cancer um, than their counterparts or dying early versus their counterparts who are similar age. Women with early stage breast cancer, two times more likely to die. Women with DCIS, and this will surprise you, were between 20 and 30 percent less likely to die than their counterparts without breast cancer. This provides further evidence that DCIS is not life-threatening and most women are over-treated for it and that they, most women might be better off not knowing that they have it. A, diet, a diagnosis of DCIS seems to have no adverse effect on life expectancy. The most important reason, let's back up a little further now and let's talk about screening in general. The most important reason for people to have a screening test is to reduce the risk of dying of a disease or of comorbidities related to the disease. The rationale for early detection of breast cancer is that early detection leads to effective treatment, which then reduces the risk of developing more serious or late stage and potentially fatal cancers. But studies show that most women with DCIS don't develop invasive breast cancer, as I illustrated earlier. Furthermore, we have diagnosed over 500,000 women with DCIS since we started doing mammograms on anybody that would sit still for it, and there has made, this has made almost no difference in the incidence of late-stage cancer. Now, what this means is either treatment for DCIS is miserably ineffective or that DCIS really is not cancer. And um, what you do find, and the research is quite clear on this, is that what mammograms are good at detecting is um, these slow-growing, not cancers, pseudo-disease, as Dr. Gilbert Welch calls it, uh, not very good at catching those interval cancers, that, so they're called, that grow quickly in between screenings. Um, and by the way, if you want to read, read a great book on this topic that doesn't just cover um, breast cancer screening but covers cancer screening in general, read Should I Get Tested for Cancer? Maybe Not and Here's Why by Gilbert Welch. There are two lectures based on this, um, uh, based on this book on the concierge platform. So if you're interested in watching the lectures, detailed slide presentations accompany them, uh, just call our office at 614-841-7700 or email me at pampopper at msn.com. Now, basically, women should be made aware of all the stuff we're talking about before consenting to a mammogram, since mammograms are more likely to detect DCIS. They certainly should be made aware of all of this that we've been talking about before they consent to any treatment. I really think it is time to rethink cancer treatment, or cancer screening, rather, and the definition of cancer. I don't think there's a lot of appetite for doing it. There is just too much money being made. Think about 500,000 women and the value of the monetary value of all that screening and biopsies and surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and follow-up mammograms and drug treatment and doctor visits and on and on and on. We just have to teach patients to say no. That's the only hope we're going to dry this up. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.